All right, well, what a blessing to be in church on Thursday night. Better than the best hospital in town. I'm glad that you're here, and I appreciate very much your coming. I don't take that lightly, especially with everything that's going on. I'd kind of like to address something tonight that probably won't be um, one of your favorite topics to talk about, and it's not uh, backsliding. Uh, it's something that a lot of people deal with nowadays, but there's a lot of pressure on Christians that they're supposed to be able to handle anything that gets thrown at them. And I know that we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. But let me ask you a question. You ever been, even though you're a saved individual, you ever been somewhat overwhelmed? You ever been somewhat uh, insurmountable things begin to pile up on you? And you're thinking, man, I, I don't even know how I'm going to be able to get out of this stinking mess that I'm in. Sometimes it can be physical issues, sometimes it can be psychological issues, sometimes it can be things, thank you, that can uh, overwhelm you from a, even a spiritual perspective. Christians have darkness, dark hours. Christians have hard times, especially alone times. I believe downtime is a dangerous time. I mean, I, I see all the Christians, you know, hallelujah, glory to God, praise the Lord, and running the pews and running around the building, and I like that. I mean, I don't have any problem with that at all. My problem's not during that stuff. It's when I get by myself and get alone and start looking at my life and looking at my failures. You ever had a besetting sin before? That's rhetorical. I, I know that you have, but I mean, the Bible teaches you about having a besetting sin. Paul said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. So I've talked to you tonight a little bit about a weight. He doesn't say that the weight is sin. But sometimes you can get so heavily burdened about some things and some difficulties that come your way that it's real difficult to overcome. And let's face it, you know where you're going when you die. So the temptation is, to be straight up honest with you, is, is well, let's just speed up the process. And so then you eat yourself into a hole in the ground or you take too much medication or you wind up doing it because you have this idea that life is not worth living. You have to recognize this, ladies and gentlemen. God put you here for a purpose. Amen. I know you don't think he did, but he did. God's got a reason for everything that happens in your life. Everything has a reason for it. And it is to give him glory, Amen. and it is to do something he's called you to do. Yeah. Well, what is it? Well, it's not always preaching. You know, it's not always somebody that's a preacher or a missionary. Sometimes it's just being faithful to do the little things. But it's hard to do the little things, isn't it, when you're so heavily weighted down? And then there comes this uh, stupid virus thing comes along, and I'm not saying that to belittle it. I know it, whatever it is is real, and I know that a lot of people have died as a result of it, so I'm not making fun of that. But then that virus comes along as if life in and of itself was not enough. Now you're worrying every time you turn around whether or not I'm going to get sick or somebody I'm exposed to is going to get sick. And so now, you know, you went through the deal, or at least where I'm from, we went through the situation where, well, your kid's been exposed, and so now you have to quarantine your whole family for 14 days. There is nothing worse than being shut up in a hole in the ground. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's like being with Saddam Hussein in a spider hole over there. You know, he's been living in the palace, and then he goes over there, and they find him in a spider hole. Did you see what he looked like when he came out? Yeah. Well, that's what living in a hole will do for you. <laughs> but sometimes you live in your own hole between your ears. You know, what you see in the morning when you wake up is just bleak, no matter how bright the sun shines, and no matter how happy everybody is around you, it's kind of like, yeah, well, I'm glad they're happy, but I'm not happy, and I wonder what's going to happen today. It reminds me of the story of a fellow that was all the time praising the Lord for everything. He's like your preacher, you know, well, I'm really sick, you know, well, praise the Lord, you know, and <laughs> okay, you know, and <laughs> Well, I'm not doing well. i got to go see the doctor. He gave me some bad news. Well, praise the Lord, you know, that kind of a deal. He was that kind of a fella. And he's walking along through there, and he really irritated the guys that he was around by being that way all the time. And thank God, praise the Lord. Thank God, praise the Lord. And so he lived in a third-story apartment building. He went up on that third story up there, and, and the guys took a broom handle and jammed it in the threshold of the door. So when he opened the door to come out to go to work, he tripped over that thing and fell down all three flights of stairs and rolled out into the street and tore his suit all to pieces and all that kind of stuff and was bleeding kind of half conscious and that kind of a deal. And those guys stood around him and says, let me see you here, praise the Lord for that. And he thought for a minute, he said, well, praise the Lord, that's over with for today. <laughs> well, that's a pretty good way to look at things sometimes. 
But you know what? Sometimes when you get depressed and downtrodden and you get discouraged, no matter how funny it is, it just ain't funny. Did you know there's stuff about that in the Bible? If you ever think about Peter, Peter really made a mess, didn't he? You think about it, Peter, you're going to betray me? No, not me, Lord. Yeah, Peter, you're going to betray me. No, Lord, though all these others will betray you, not me. I'm, I ain't no way I'm going to betray you, Lord. No, Peter, before the cock crows in the morning twice, you're going to deny me three times. No, no, Lord, I'm telling you, it ain't going to happen. There's just no way. He's calling the Lord a liar. That's pretty bold, isn't it? Yeah, Lord, hey, you're lying. It ain't going to happen. Not me. You don't know who you're talking to. I'm, I'm Peter. <laughs> well, you know what happens. He goes out there and he denies the Lord. And the next thing you know, here comes the Lord out of the praetorium there. And this is after two little maidens, two little girls probably younger than 14 that have been out there serving coffee and tea. And he wasn't in front of an inquisition. He wasn't in front of a firing squad. He wasn't in front of any major big group of individuals. He just... Just a couple of little girls came up. Are you that man? I'm not. I don't even know that man. And he cusses and swears and he scares the little girl at the beginning to half to death. And she goes back and gets her friend and she comes out and, you know, aren't you Peter? Aren't you the big fisherman? I think I know who you are. I don't know who you are and I don't know who he is and so on and so forth. And about that time he turns and the roaster crows and uh, crows two times. About that time the Lord comes out and all it took was the Lord to just look at him. You know what the Bible said? He went out and he wept bitterly. You know what he did after he went out and wept, even after he saw the resurrected Lord? He went fishing. You know what happens when you get down, discouraged, and depressed? You want to be by yourself. You don't want to be around people. You don't want to talk. You get withdrawn. Nobody understands me. Nobody gets me. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a reason why the number one commercial running next to car commercials on television nowadays are pharmaceuticals for depression. It's a real thing. And as a Christian, I wish I could tell you that as a Christian, like the one uh, 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 donkey said one time in a pulpit and was preaching to a big crowd of people and said anybody that's taken medication is against God and against the devil. I mean, is uh, worshiping the devil and pharmaceuticals or this and that and the other. And I thought, boy, you sure are stupid to say something like that. You say, why? Sometimes you have to take medicine to get well. Sometimes you have to take medicine to be able to do it. This ain't a message against medicine. Do what your doctor tells you to do. Unfortunately, you're still a human being. We talked about that this morning. You're in your flesh. You've got to take care of your flesh. You, I, I hate to tell you this, reading your Bible and stuff like that, it don't do a lot for your flesh. It helps your spirit. It helps your soul. But as far as your flesh, it can help to keep it under control. But a lot of times, you can't make it lay down. I mean, if you could, wouldn't life be better? <laughs> yeah, well, let me say this. If you could, it'd be better for me, right? If I could get mine to lay down and do what it's supposed to do. But the problem is, is that Christians sometimes have the pressure of the world put on them and they're supposed to be acting like they don't ever have problems and they don't have difficulties and have nothing, nothing's wrong and everything's great and everything's roses and popcorn and peanuts and, and uh, cotton candy and unicorns and everything's wonderful. No, everything's not always wonderful. All throughout that Bible, you know what Moses did? He killed a man, buried him in the sand, thought he was doing, messed up his calling. He went to Midian for 40 years. You say, what was that? He's just running. He's discouraged. I made a mess. I can never be used again. Now, in your Bible, you're going to find, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories here tonight from the Bible and some things I want you to pay attention to. And the reason I tell you these things is to not belittle or to make fun of you, but what happens to you when you get in this particular situation? You get a distorted perception of things. And what happens is, is you get what we used to call tunnel vision. You get auditory exclusion. That means you can't really hear what's being said. And then you get tunnel vision. You lose your ability to see things and your perceptive vision begins to fall. So out here uh, where you have that perceptive field that's there, all of a sudden everything else is like this. You have tunnel vision. You can't see anything except what's right directly in front of you. And that's a bad situation to be in. It's called tunnel vision. And when you get that tunnel vision and you get auditory exclusion, it will inevitably drive you to a very dark place. Now, the Bible teaches you that no man ever uh, hateth himself or hateth his flesh, but he loveth and cherisheth it. So I will say this to you. Uh, when your flesh is looking for an easy way out, uh, that's not God talking to you. That's either you're on the verge of breaking through and uh, God giving you some victory over some things in your flesh or that's the devil trying to tell you before you amount to anything that you need to just go ahead and check out. 
Now, I hope you don't mind me being plain with you. You know what I used to do. I did it for a number of years, over 20 years. I'm not going to tell you a bunch of horrible, terrible stories. I was just in Ohio. I finished preaching a message. I used an illustration there about a young man that went in and uh, shot a guy to stop and rob, and I dealt with him after they got through getting all of his information and stuff like that. I went in and talked to him. He had a good profession of faith. I believe the boy was saved. And he was scared to death, and he just kept saying, I just want to die. He curled up in the edge of the room there, laying on the floor in the fetal position, just balled up there, bawling and crying and stuff. And I got him up to the table and prayed with him and stuff like that. And he said to me, he said, you know, the Lord, can he ever forgive me? I said, we forgave Moses, forgave David. I said, he'll forgive you. And he prayed and asked the Lord to forgive him. And then, you know, he said, well, what happens now? And I said, well, you go to your new permanent address. You've got to go to Florida State Prison. I guess he's probably still sitting there. He went 25 to life back then, so he wound up being uh, there. I'm sure he's probably an old man now. If, if he's out by now, and that'd been, oh, man, that's been 30, 30 years ago more, I guess. So he's over there. He'd be up in his 50s now, been sitting around over there, rotten, paying for that thing. But you know what he said? <clears throat> I used that illustration. I said, well, if you're looking at time, at least the Lord will go with you in there. I didn't know there was a kid sitting out there. And that kid is, uh, had been a heroin addict, and he had been a meth addict. Anytime somebody is addicted to something like that, it may start off as fun and games, but they generally gravitate toward those things because they're missing something. I'll come back to that in a second. You ever look at the woman at the well? You know, she goes out there in the middle of the afternoon where you know, only the bad people go out there. I mean, nobody goes out in the middle of the day to draw water. The only people that are allowed to go out there are the misfits in society, the robbers and the bad people and the prostitutes and all that. And here's Jesus out there. You ever wonder what that woman's doing out there? You ever wonder why she was in the mess she was? When the Lord talks to her, you know what he says to her? He says, uh, you married? You got a husband? She goes, um, uh, well, no, sir. He said, well said. <laughs> Must not be an independent Baptist. He told the truth. He said, uh, you know, the one you're with now is not your husband, and you've had five others, none of them hers. You ever wonder why somebody's behavior is like that? Did you ever pause to think about it just from her perspective that she's so down on herself, she's so hard on herself that she doesn't mind being a home wrecker at all? I mean, she's taken five other husbands out of five other homes that probably had children and things. Do you ever consider that, that from her perspective that she's looking for something? I mean, maybe she got hurt when she was a kid. Maybe she was abused when she was a kid. You don't know the story doesn't say. The joy, all, all we have a tendency to do is look at somebody like that and go, man, psh, I wouldn't be that way. Well, but by the grace of God, you'd be out here with a needle in your arm walking the streets to pay for your habit. You can't say you wouldn't be that way. It's God that keeps you from that stuff. You know, well, I'm just real disciplined. And all. Oh, put the crack pipe down, man. You're not fooling me. I've been around it way too many years. You have to understand that. I see that woman coming and I think to myself the first thing, you know, she comes with a mohawk, probably lime green and looks like she lost a fight with a paint gun in a paint booth or something. She's got so many tats over and, and that kind of thing. She's got holes all in her ears and her nose and everywhere else you can imagine with chains and all kind of piercings and things like that. Probably got a bone through her nose. She don't have enough clothes to make a pair of britches for a blue jay. And she's coming over to come over there to get her some water. Well, that's how you paint sinners, isn't it? Couldn't be somebody like you that needs a drink, is it? Couldn't be that you're thirsty, is it? That old woman that I met up there in Jacksonville, Florida, she was 80-something years old. I want to say 82, but it was 82 or 86. I remember when I met that woman, my first introduction to that old woman, she was back in a hospital bed, way back in the back of those days, University Hospital, the county hospital, and she was back there. She was shriveled up like a prune. She looked like skin, a skeleton with skin stripped over it. And man, I'm telling you what, I never heard such foul language coming out of a woman's mouth in all my life. And I walked back there and I looked at that woman and she looked at me and I was the only one there in a blue uniform. Everybody else was in white and green scrubs and they're trying to get her tied down so they can give her some stuff to calm her down and I'm just supposed to be a witness. And that woman, I mean, tell you what, she gave me a cussing and made my stinking ears turn red and embarrassed me. And you know what her problem was? I've told you the story before. Years ago I told you the story. You know what her problem was? She was dehydrated acting out of character. She'd been laying in her bed, laying in her hallway. The well had busted. Her son-in-law didn't come by to fix it. She hadn't had anything to drink in about three days. At about 95 degrees outside, hair, house and air conditioning busted on it. No air conditioning working. She laid it out, laid it out there and just out of her mind, cussing and swearing and all that. 
you know what happened? They started giving her some fluids and they opened up that valve all the way and started running that stuff. She soaked that stuff up like a sponge laying up on the side of a sink. I'm going to get to this in just a minute, but just let, me, just let me set this up for you. And all of a sudden, man, turn that thing open and that stuff started coming in and you see her looking around and she's, and she says, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what have I done, what have I done? And then she fixated on me and I thought, not me again, man. She said, come here, young man. They had her strapped down. I said, yes, man. I walked over there. She's reaching for my hand. She's strapped like this. She's reaching for my hand like that. And I reached down there and I grabbed a hold of her hand. She says, I need you to, to help me. And I said, I'm doing my best to try to help you, doing all I can for you right now. She said, no, I, I need for you to go get everybody I've talked to. And whatever it is I've done, I want them all to come in here. And I went and gathered all those people. And one at a time, she said, I want to apologize. She said, I'm a... Christian woman and I don't know what I did or what I said but I'm sure it wasn't right you know what she needed she was dried out she just needed a drink from the fountain you know why she was acting that way you know why she was so messed up in her mind you know why she couldn't see things? if you were to talk to her you would think that she was a complete human being just crazy no all it was she was so dehydrated her brain was all dried out and man I mean you talk about I mean, absolutely crazy. And then they took those after half of the next bag came through. They took the restraints off of her. And I remember her rubbing those little old hands, man. I mean, hands looked like cellophane draped across that. You see the veins sticking out in them and all. And that old skin had been all bruised and battered up and stuff like that. She reached up there with those hands shaking. And they're just cold now because they're full of fluid, you know. And she grabbed my hands like that. And all she could say was, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. You say, what did she need? Oh, she needed to go to jail. She needed to just end life. No, she just needed a drink of water and somebody to care until she got enough water in her where she could come to her own senses. Amen. You know what I guarantee you tonight, if you don't need what I'm going to say to you tonight, you're going to need it somewhere along the line. You know why I know that? Because you got the stuff with the virus going on, and as soon as this virus passes, you know what I know? I know there'll be financial ruin come your way. I know there'll be death come your way. I know there'll be divorce come your way. I know there'll be all kind of things. Well, I talked to this kid there in Ohio the same way, and he came up after the meeting, and he said, I would like to introduce myself, and he gave me his name, and I said, well, it's nice to meet you. I could tell them looking at him, he had kind of had a little bit of a rough life. I said, well, what are you here? He said, well, I just want you to know I just got saved. I said, well, praise the Lord. And he said, uh, could I tell you something? And he kind of whispered under his breath, and I said, sure. So we went in the other side of the room there in the foyer area, and I said, what's up, man? And he said, well, he said, I was on heroin, I was on meth, and he said, and it got so bad, I, I hung myself. He said, I stayed hung for 14 minutes. And I looked at him and I said, uh, young man, I don't know if you know what I used to do for a living, but I said, I've seen a lot of people hang, and, um, and I'm looking and I can see a, a mark, and I said, 14 minutes, you'd be brain dead. And he said, the doctors were amazed that there's only two parts of my brain that aren't functioning properly. He said, I don't know how it happened. And I said, you realize what would have happened? You know what he said? He didn't say I would have died. You know what he said? I'd have gone straight to hell. I said, well, you better thank God for that. He said, you know, you mentioned about that kid that uh, killed the man. And I said, yeah. And he said, did, did the Lord go with him in prison? I said, well, said he would. said he would be with him always, even to the end. I said, so... Yeah, he'll never leave you, never forsake you. If you're saved, he'll go with you in there. won't get you out of it. I said, why do you ask? And he said, I'm looking at 14 years. <coughs> See, instead of him doing his jail time, he was just going to go ahead and check out. And if he'd have checked out, you know what would have happened? He'd have been burning right now. Now, I'm, I'm not, again, here to tell you a whole bunch of stories. I look at people like that. I look at them differently than I did back in the days of the blue suit. Look at them differently back in the days. I'm thinking to myself, what's missing in their life? That's a soul you're looking at. That's a soul that you're, you're staring at that, that individual. You've got to be thinking to yourself, maybe they're messed up as a soup sandwich, but why? What is it that they're missing, and what can you do to help? You have certain things that you're able to do. Hey, Brother Brad, good to see you, man. And so you have, to, you have to remember that when you run across people like that, God allows them to come across your path for a reason. That doesn't mean you dole out to everybody that's on the street corner out here with a sign that says, we'll work for food. 
you know that ain't true. Say, get in, we're going to go work for food. And they're like, no, I don't want to work. Well, you know, you're going to get out there and get a roll big enough to choke a horse, you know, from some stupid Christian giving them money and stuff like that. God bless you because you feel guilty and have a guilty conscience. Load them up, tell them to get in there and have them go rake your yard. I mean, the Bible does say that you're earning a living by the sweat of your brow. Amen. I wonder about that, though. I wonder about that woman with the issue of blood. You ever think about that? That's a horrible, horrible story, that woman sitting there. A couple of years ago, I preached that message to you, or a message about the woman with the issue of blood. I preach it as a woman that has issues. At least she was going to the right place to get some help. And boy, you know what happened? She's going to the right place to get some help, and everything stood in her pathway. Now, if I can show you a few places in the Bible, if you'll open it up and let me just show you a couple of things here. If I can show you that some of the greatest men in the Bible, who I believe is one of the greatest ones, is the greatest preacher in the Old Testament to me. Uh, if I can show you he had a problem with depression, would you maybe just admit that maybe you might need some help with that? Yeah. Say, well, I'm not depressed. Okay, discouraged. Well, I'm not discouraged. Okay, downtrodden. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not depressed, discouraged, or downtrodden. Okay, discombobulated. <laughs> Discontent. Uh, there's got to be a D in there somewhere for you, right? <laughs> but you're not dead. Amen. But if you keep going down that path, you know what will happen? Those voices will talk to you. Now, I know what I'm talking about. Amen. I've had them talking to me. Amen. From me to sister right here, talking to them. And watch them right in front of me, right there, right there less than 10 feet away, and watch them step from this life into the next life. That's not something you want to see. You can't unsee it. You say, what is it? In such a serious situation of desperation, they see absolutely no way out. Listen, the Bible tells that the Lord's got a way for you to come out. Watch. The temptation is not always the temptation to just do something evil and wicked, some lustful thing. There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man. But the Lord will with the temptation provide for you a way of escape. What is the temptation? I'm ready to just get out. I've had enough. The virus comes along and then you try to work and you can't work. And if you're going to work, you've got to wear a mask if you work. And you've got to wear gloves and you've got to wear a hazmat suit. And you can do this and you can do that or you can't do this. Or they lay you off and pay you to work at home. And then your money dries up at home and this and that and the other. And the next thing you know, you know what you're thinking? Well, what's the point, man? I can't even get ahead. It's not laziness, but it's depressing. And then you go to try to get a job somewhere and you're interested in working and trying to take care of yourself or take care of your family. I hope this is making some sense to you. It's not something I'm jumping up and down having a great time preaching about. It's depressing. But I'm dealing with that now. I have people calling me when I'm traveling and things like that. And preacher, can I talk to you? Preacher, can you help me? Preacher, I'm struggling with this. I'm talking people even that look successful, struggling in their marriage, struggling with their kids. There's all kind of stress that's out there right now. And it's a reality. You can make fun of it all you want, but it's there. I mean, you can feel it on the road. Me and the preacher went to get a, something to eat here today, a sweet potato or something and a salad or something. He was real good. He, he did good. And, and, he, uh, and we're, we're pulling into the thing, and this, this person just literally just changed lanes. It was no big deal, and the car's running down the middle of the lane, and the car was going faster than he ought to be going. He just laid on the horn for like 10 seconds. Just, I'm thinking... What is that guy's problem? And in the old days, I'm thinking, where's the blue light switch, man? I'm gonna, I wouldn't tune up the guy that pulled in front of him. I'd tune Mr. Hornman along, you know. Of course, down here, you got to be careful with the senior centers or something like that. You know what? Bite me, you know, honk and, honk and run. Because instead of hit and run, you might honk and run, and it might cause them to have a heart attack. <clears throat> I was coming here tonight. And there was a dear old saint there, a dear old person in front of me. I don't know. It looked like she was on up there in age a little bit. She's squinting. She's looking between the steering wheel and the dash, you know, <laughs> driving like this. And I'm behind her. I'm going 26 miles an hour in a 45-mile-an-hour zone. <laughs> Boy, if that don't put you in touch with Jesus, I don't know what does. <laughs> Man, I'm thinking, you know, and I'm thinking, no, don't do it. Don't do it. You'll scare us. You'll run off the road and hit in the ditch and be gone. It'll be fought. Honk and run, you know. So <laughs> I better leave it alone. So maybe the Lord slowed me down for a reason. Maybe the Lord said, slow down, man. If you get out and get around her, you may get broadsided. How do you know? You don't know. 
God did that and said, back off, man. She's, she's doing the best she can. Maybe she doesn't have somebody to come. To come pick her up. Maybe she don't have nobody to get groceries for. Maybe she can't afford the drop off at the door, stuff like that. You in such a big hurry, getting to church five more minutes early is going to make that much. You so important. Kind of backed off, became her blocking back, you know, back away from her so nobody could get up there and get around her and let her. You should have seen her, man. She doesn't like it. She might be sitting here tonight. I hope not. You know, <laughs> that was me, preacher. That was me. Was that you that was behind me? I saw you back there. You were making funny faces at me. I saw you. You know, <laughs> yeah, maybe one or two. You know, <laughs> but but now, but now, but now, listen. Sometimes we don't pause to think. We don't know. As one preacher said to me years ago. He said to me, he said, you preacher, he said, you want to always remember this when you're preaching? And I said, okay, lay it on me. And he said, uh, you never know what's in somebody's saddlebags. I thought, man, that'll go. He said, when you're preaching, you never know what you're preaching to. I didn't know that kid was sitting out there last, this past weekend. I didn't know he was sitting there. And I give an illustration about a kid that did something's going to prison and the kid hears the illustration and makes the connection and said, man, I need Jesus to go with, go with me. And, and the kid got saved. Amen. Now, look, if you will, please, in 1 Kings and give you a story. You know, I, I see that story about the woman in adultery. Uh, I, I've, uh, I've read that story before. I, I think it's an odd sort of a story. 1 Kings, we'll pick it up in 19. I'm going to tell you a story before I get there. But It's always amazed me how they bring that woman there and they don't bring the man. Now, if you're a woman, you've got you to be thinking about that because that just, that is, that's unfair on so many levels it isn't even funny. Would you agree? That is the epitome of discrimination. And that woman is brought and she doesn't have a leg to stand on. She's been caught probably by an individual that's a part of the group that caught her be honest with you it's probably a setup and so they did that in order to try to catch Jesus there and here that woman is taken in adultery but you got to pause for a minute and think to yourself why was that woman willing to do that with a man and she had just met him you say well she's just an old prostitute or you will use whatever flavorful term you want to use to describe her no it's not what I ask you why what was she looking for did she have a daddy that didn't love her? I'm not a psychiatrist or psychologist. I'm not trying to be some counselor to you. What's missing in that woman's life that would cause her to be with a stranger like that? You say, well, maybe she had brain trouble. Maybe. Maybe she did. Maybe there was something wrong as far as, uh, meant, but the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that. She understood right and wrong. She understood sin. You say, why? Because the Lord said, where are those thine accusers? And she said, there are none. He said, okay, neither do I accuse thee. Go and sin no more. She understood that, right? But what was she missing? All through the Bible, people are coming. They're coming with leprosy. They're coming with blindness. There's individuals there walking through. The sons died. The Lord stops the funeral procession and raises the widow's main son back up there. He winds up dying a couple of times. He, you know, dies a little bit later on after coming back from the dead. There's Lazarus that comes back. The Lord's always interjecting himself into people's problems. Now, I want to ask you a question. You're in this day and age. Why don't you let him interject himself into your problems? He is the greatest problem solver there is. And too often what we do is we blame God for whatever mess we're in. No, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. And because you're in the world, the Bible says that man is born under trouble as the sparks fly upward. And so it's your perception of how things are. I don't know why you're going through what you're going through. I don't have answers for you. But I can tell you this, just money on the table or just a leg up is not going to resolve long term your problem. You listen, do you know how many people that are in Hollywood that commit suicide? And they got millions of dollars and all kind of fame and every kind of else thing. You say, why? Something's missing. Now, whenever this situation occurs, what happens is, and I am not being derogatory, demeaning, and I'm not being uh, where I'm condescending and talking down to you. I'm telling you it is an indicator that your eyes are in the wrong place. You're looking and thinking about yourself instead of looking and thinking about him Amen. and then having the humility to say, Lord, I need some help because if you don't, I'm going to do something stupid. Now that's just the fact of the matter. 
So you have a story here, and I'll just go through the passage there in 1 Kings chapter number 18 where they have the showdown up there on Mount Carmel. And Elijah goes up there on Mount Carmel after he builds the altar. We were going to talk about that tonight, but we won't. And they get the altar built because they hadn't been going to the altar. I will say this to you. I don't think the drought would have been prevalent if they had been going to the altar and staying in fellowship with the Lord. How do I know that they weren't worshiping the Lord? Not just because they're worshiping Baal and sitting at Jezebel's table. I know that because when he gets ready to offer his sacrifice, he had to rebuild the altar because the altar hadn't been in use. One of the things that people should have been doing during a time of great stress and distress, there's no rain, there's a drought that's there. Shouldn't they have been praying? You know what they're doing? They're sitting there feasting at Jezebel's table. They're hanging out with the wrong people. They're worshiping the wrong God. I mean, they're not doing what they ought to be doing. Well, I mean, tell me that's not what people do nowadays. Instead of going to God, they start looking for all kind of other answers to their problems. And God's saying, hey, what about me? The reason it wasn't raining was because they weren't worshiping God and they had allowed some other things to creep in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can't get around the Bible when the Bible says to you, you reap what you sow. Amen. And if you put the wrong seeds in the ground, those seeds are going to come up. Pray for a crop failure. But if you keep focusing in the wrong area, then sooner or later those things are going to overwhelm or take over your life. And there's nothing you can do because it's like jumping off the building. Something's going to break. And it won't be the concrete. Right. You're going to get hurt. That's a law. It's a law, a biblical law, a spiritual law. You can't keep living in the carnal world and expect spiritual help. You have to recognize that if I'm doing something I should not be doing in my flesh, of the flesh you shall reap what? Corruption's a bad thing. So, so one of the things that has to happen and one of the things that will help you in a mental sort of a standpoint is is to recognize if a, as a man thinketh in his heart so is he so why am I thinking wrong? Because I'm thinking the wrong way about the wrong things and it can get to be a real dark hole. The next thing you know, you're self-diagnosing and then there's a problem. Well, Ahab gets uh, down, I mean, uh, Elijah gets up there and he gets ready to pray and he tells his servant, he said, uh, you see a cloud up there? He said, no, you see a cloud? No, you see a cloud? Yeah, I do see a cloud. It's about the size of a man's hand out there. He said, man, going to come a frog strangler. Boy, better tell everybody to hightail it. Go down there and tell Jehu to get the chariots and get Ahab and head for the high country, man. It's fixing to come running. I mean, fixing to come raining. And so he runs down and tells them, and the people begin to hightail it back toward the city, and they begin to move back down through there, and the dust is beginning to billow up behind the chariots, and the people are running, and the lightning is beginning to strike the ground down there, and the thunder's rolling, the skies are pitch black, and that, first of all, that little bit of a cool breeze begins to blow, and then that heavy-duty cold rain comes in, coming down in buckets, man. I mean, it is raining everything you can possibly imagine. And Elijah, the Lord says, uh, how are you getting back? Nobody even gave him a ride back. And the Lord said, well, I'll tell you what, you can hike on your own. He said, well, okay. And he said, no, I want you to run. And Elijah, I don't know if he'd been doing some kind of uh, special exercises or whatever it was, but the Lord had him to check it out. He felt like the road runner. And the next thing you know, he takes off running. He said, man, this is pretty good. He's running. He's not even winded. And he runs up there next to a horse and chariot, and the horse and chariot are running wide open. And he leans over there, and in my mind's eye, I wish I could paint. This would be one I'd paint. I'd have those horses, double horses, two of them, a team of horses, then dead run. The nostrils are flaring, boy. The lathered up sweat's pouring off their back, man. And that Jehu is swacking them horses, man, and getting them to go faster like that. And those horses are wild-eyed running into that storm and stuff like that. And then I'd have Elijah running up there. Hey, how you doing, man? I'd be talking like that. <laughs> And have the king look over there and him say, well, Man, what are you doing here? You are, aren't you he that troubleth Israel? Yeah, but I'm going to outrun your horses, man. And, you know, Jehu, get up there, you know. And the horse moves up, and then Elijah moves up, and he plays around a little bit, and then <laughs> he runs into the city. He beats everybody in the city. And I got him leaning on the gate like this when the king comes in, you know. I mean, he wouldn't be a smoker, but if he was, he'd be, you know. <sighs> and when I was in the police academy a lot of years ago, there was a guy about this big around. <clears throat> we go around six miles every day. Come back at the end. This guy was always wanting to go at the end. Go, let me 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 go. He'd tell the guy that was our drill instructor. And he'd take off and let him go the last mile. And he'd be over there. You know, irritating thing, most irritating thing in the world. He'd be running the whole time and talking like I'm talking to you. 
It never bothered him at all. He'd be down there at the end when you cross over the finish line and get ready to go over the wall and do the stuff before you go to the showers. He'd be standing down there, you know. And I'm thinking, I don't eat wrong, I don't drink, I don't smoke, and I'm dying running out here. And here this guy is smoking a couple packs of cigarettes a day, and he runs like no tomorrow. Anyhow, I'd have Elijah sitting there. He wouldn't be smoking. He might be chewing a little bit, but he wouldn't be smoking. <laughs> and I got a different kind of Elijah. <laughs> but he's been out in the woods a while. I mean, you know, come on. But, but at any rate, I, it's not in the Bible. I'm just messing with you. And then after that's over with, Elijah goes to the, somebody lets him in, and he goes into the house, and his servant's there, and knock at the door. Elijah says, hey, man, you want to get the mail? And the guy comes to the door, he says, hey, man, it's a letter from the king. He says, pretty good, look at this, it's got the king's seal. You want to put it up there on the mantle? He said, heck no, man, bust the thing open. They're probably going to have a party. They're going to find up the whole nation of Israel is going to have great revival. Everything's going to be wonderful. They've turned. They're going to keep their word from up on Carmel because they said whoever wins, they're going to worship that God. They're going to worship that God. Man, this is going to be great, man. Open the thing up. And it's a letter from Jesse. And Jesse says, uh, if you're not like my 450 prophets, uh, Baal, by this time tomorrow, my name ain't Jezebel. And that's where you pick up the story, right here in 1 Kings 19. Let's just look at a couple of things real quick. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done with all how he had slain all the prophets of the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, would you agree with me when I tell you that he had a distorted perception? When he saw that, what did he see? He saw the letter. He saw his death warrant. This guy has just stood against 850 prophets of Baal. 450 in one place and 400 in another. And he killed them all in the brook Kidron. And he's got somebody that wrote him a letter. Well, here's his death warrant. You're going to be dead like they are by this time tomorrow. And when he saw that, perception's distorted. Boy, it's a bad deal. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Literally, a couple of days before, he called down fire from heaven and God protected him and then supernaturally enabled him to outrun horses. I mean, I would, you know, we want to know if God's hand's on you? <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, that's a pretty major deal. Go back just a little further. He raised a woman's son to life that was dead. He did eat her last biscuit, but at any rate, I mean... <laughs> But, but would you say God was on him? Amen. But look what happens. One thing. And he saw that. And what does the Bible say that he did? The Bible said, and when he saw that, he arose and he went for his life. Well, that's interesting. Self-preservation steps in. And he went for his life and he came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. See, there you go. I want to be alone. I want to be by myself. Look at what happens, verse number 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and watched it. And he requested for himself that he might what? It's a pretty serious thing, isn't it? Here's Elijah. You say, what do you think's wrong with Elijah? I think Elijah came running back over there after that thing and he's expecting a great revival. You know, there's nothing worse than expectations. They often lead to disappointments. You know what he thought? He thought the people wouldn't lie to him and he thought after they saw the power of God and saw what happened, he thought for sure, I guarantee you, man, they're going to fall down and worship God. I'm going to turn the entire nation of Israel back over to God. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be marvelous. I mean, everything's going to be like it's supposed to be, right? That's what he was expecting. That's what they said they would do. And instead he gets a letter from Jezebel. You know what it says? I'm going to kill you. Instead of I'm going to be grateful for you and I'm going to appreciate you and I'm going to take care of you and you're going to be now the prophet until we get the priest set back up and get the temple opened up and get everything done and we're going to restore Israel to its heyday and how it ought to be. Instead, his expectations led to disappointment. That disappointment led to him departing. You know what he said? I'm out of here. You say, why? Well, imagine this. He went in there, thought it was going to be a great revival, and not a, doesn't see any individual there. Now, I know later on there's 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal. 
But ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand, not a one of those 7,000 opened their cotton-picking mouth when he was up there by himself. You can't blame him for feeling that way. I and I alone, Lord, am standing for thee. And the Lord said, no, there's 7,000 other ones, but I understand you say what happened. Your perception's distorted. You're the only one going through it. You're the only one having the problem. You're the only one that understands what, what is actually happening to you. You get to talking to yourself. And the next thing you know, you get to answering yourself. And it didn't long before you can talk yourself into a hole. Is this helping anybody at all? You say, what, even Christians do that? Yeah, he's a preacher. The greatest prophet in the Old Testament, man. He's a prophet. You know what he said? It is enough, just let me die, watch it. I'm no better than my fathers. My fathers couldn't turn the nation of Israel. I'm just a disappointment. I'm no good to anybody. What's the use? I'm not going to let that old witch kill me. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and I'm going to ask the Lord to kill me himself. He's ready to die. But you've got to recognize something. If the Lord doesn't kill him, he's going to die from exposure. He's out in the wilderness under a juniper tree. He's out there surrounded by wild animals. He doesn't have any water and he has no food. It's just a matter of time. He's going to die. It's going to be a slow death, but he's going to die. He went out there to die. You say, what did his servant go? He cut his servant loose on the edge of the wilderness and went out there by himself. You say, why? Because he was not thinking right. He didn't care if somebody knocked him in the head. He didn't care if a wolf got him, a bear, a lion, a tiger got him. He didn't care if he got destroyed. It didn't make any difference to him whatsoever. He didn't care about himself anymore. That's not natural. It's different when we talk about giving in to the flesh for lustful pleasures, but when it comes to what the Bible says about your flesh, the Lord said, hey, I gave you that body. That body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and you're supposed to do something to take care of it. That's what I'm using to carry that soul around right now to do something for me so that you can relate to, relate to other human beings. And God says, man, what are you doing? You say, what happened? He's disappointed. It didn't work out that way. He flunked school. He didn't get the job. He thought everything was going to be fine. He was going to get his first paycheck. And they wound up taking 90% of the paycheck out to pay for uniforms and to pay for this and to pay for that, pay for this. He didn't even have enough to get a hamburger down at the Burger King or whatever it is that's around here and that kind of a thing. You know what he does? He goes home and he goes, you know what? I can't ever seem to get ahead. And about that time, you know, a special delivery comes in and here comes an eviction notice. And you slam the doors and then the lights flicker and the next thing you know, the lights go out. You go out in the mailbox and you look and it's past due three months and you're thinking, well, at least I got water. And you go to turn the water on and it's out too. Well, what's the use? You're ready to crank up the car the next morning and you turn on the car and you, you don't have any gas. The battery is dead. You've got to try to go to work. Now you can't go to work. And then you finally do manage to get to work. You thumb or you walk or whatever it might be. And then you walk in the door and the boss says, you can't be here on time. You're fired. And you walk out there and about that time thunderstorm opens up and starts raining on you. It don't take much of that stuff to make you think somebody's picking on you. Because your perception's distorted. It's happening to people all around you. But, but right at that moment, tunnel vision, you can't see it happen to anybody but you. And before long, you know what will happen? There'll be somebody right beside you and say, yeah, I feel the same way. And now you've got some trouble. Elijah goes out there. You know what he says to that boy? He says, get out of here, kid. He said, well, preacher, don't you want me to hang around? I mean, at least when you get back, I know you're probably going out there in the wilderness to pray. Uh, when you get back, I'll be over here, and I'll have some vittles for you and things like that. He said, no, you're not bothered. You know, here's your severance pay. I'll, I'll see you later, you know. And that kind of, well, what do you mean, preacher? I said, yeah, where I'm going, you can't go, kid. Get out of here. See you later. Beat it. So the kid shrugs his shoulders and takes off. Doesn't say who the kid's name is. He winds up leaving him alone, and he goes out there an entire day's journey. He's just walking, putting one foot in front of the other. He's just delirious, just not even thinking the right way. He's just walking out there, wandering around, not making any sense of anything. The wind's blowing, the sand's blistering across his feet. That sun's beating down on him. It's drying him out, boy. He's getting more and more dehydrated, and he just puts one foot in front of another and one foot in front of another, and he's just in the lowest thing. You know what he starts doing? He starts getting down on himself. Yeah, some preacher you are, man. Good for nothing. Elijah did a tish bite. Called from tish. Why did the Lord even call me in the first place? I'm not good for nothing anyway. 
I didn't even do anything. I don't even have a convert. Don't even have a servant, a servant with me. I, all I have is a clothes on my back. What good is this life if you're not able to amass anything at all? You know, after all, I gave up everything for the Lord, and I went over there and by the brook Cherith for three years, and he took care of me, and this way he treats his servant. I mean, crazy stuff, man. You, start, you, start, you can't see anything but the bottom side of a flat rock out in the summertime, and it's just black all around you. It gets dark. You can't see things. Off in the distance over there, that sun's beginning to dip down over the horizon now, and it's starting to turn that old bright red color, and it begins to fall down. All things say, well, it's burning me up with that old ball of fire out there. And he looks in the distance, and he sees a little juniper tree out there, and he said, well, that looks as good a place as any to make a gravestone. I'll go over there. And he gets underneath the boughs of that old juniper tree there, and that wind begins to come through there. Sounds like angels playing on violins, man. And that tree begins to just sort of move and sway a little bit back and forth. And those needles from that old juniper tree laying down around there. And there's all kind of bones of animals and all kinds of uh, dead carcasses and stuff laying all around. Because anybody that would take refuge under there, the animals would come in fight over them and rip them apart and destroy them and eat them. And then rest under the juniper tree and then go off about their business. He said, enough, Lord, just let me die. He's under there now. Can you see him? He's an old man, got old wispy hair. It's all dried out, looks like straw glued to his head. The old beard is blistered and red as a beet now, laying up underneath there. He's cuddled up in the fetal position. The temperature's dropped about 40 degrees outside and gone from 100, and it's about 60 now. And he's beginning to shiver, and he's beginning to shake, and his throat is all parched and about to seal off there, and his tongue is all swollen up. And he's figuring, well, this is it. And now he's laying there in the dirt. And whenever he would breathe, the nostrils would blow that dust out of the way there. And he'd blow and he'd listen. And off in the distance, the wolves would howl. Yeah, go ahead and come eat me. You've been laughing at me all this time anyway. And there come the hyenas cackling at him. And they're moving in on him. And then next thing you know, here comes a bear growling or a lion or a tiger. He said, well, you know, you just, well, go ahead. I'm not good for nothing anyway. I'm at least to be good for animal food. I ain't no good. I'm rotten. I'm terrible. I'm overweight. I'm ugly. I ain't got no hair. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have a wife. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have a husband. I've never been married. I didn't graduate high school. I'm a, I'm a drug addict. I'm a drunk. I'm no good man. I've been with a dozen men. I've done this and I've done that. I don't know what you say when you lay down under the juniper tree. But I know we all lay down there sooner or later. Why, if you were to look real hard at that juniper tree, you know whose initials you'd see there? You'd see mine carved in the trunk of that tree. I've been right there. It's enough, Lord, just let me die. What a stinking failure in life I am. Oh, no, preacher, look at all you're getting done. <laughs> Look can be deceiving. And you're laying down there, and Elijah's laying there, and them animals are beginning to close in there, and it gets dark, man. And he's so exhausted now and so worn out and so dehydrated. He's half hallucinating. He doesn't know which way's up. He's freezing to death. Hypothermia is setting in on him now. Temperature is dropping, man. He's having a hard time doing anything. He can't get warm. He's scratching at the ground thinking pine needles are going to warm him up, man. And the next thing you know, he dozes off and he falls asleep. It's in the passage. You say, why? One of the signs of depression is, is you want to be alone and you want to sleep all the time. You say, why? It's the only time you get peace. When you sleep, you can turn your brain off. Thanks for the help. I appreciate it. Some of you are like, oh, no, I've never been that way. No, I'm not talking about being lazy. I'm talking about when you're depressed, you just want to sleep. Leave me alone. You start developing body aches and pains psychological pressure begins to manifest itself in physiological issues and then before long you're eating aspirin you're eating Tylenol and you're eating all kinds of you eat a hole in your stomach because you're taking so many anti-inflammatories and stuff and you, you eat too much one time and you don't eat enough another time you got all out of whack and you get addicted to different other things that are going on and you figure you know what if this is what life is going to be this all the time you know what it's enough just let me die Nobody's going to miss me anyway. Nobody cares about me anyway. Who's going to care less? I mean, who's his family? He ain't even got any. Where's his mom and daddy? Where's his brothers and sisters? 
Where's the 7,000 that were supposed to be with him on the mountain? Here's a good one for you. Where's God? Don't look like he's around. And he goes to sleep. Boy, that bitter taste in his mouth, man. I mean, he's bitter. He's bitter at God. He's bitter at the people. He's bitter at everybody. He said, you know something, Lord? If this is all that's... I've been through all this stuff now for three and a half years over there by the brook Kidron. I did what you told me to do. I preached what you told me to preach. And if that don't work, I'll be jumped. I've had it. Well, you can't blame him, could you? And he goes to sleep. And about that time, a lion begins to creep in on him. He's the king of the jungle, you know, and he begins to move in and he roars real loud and runs off all the other animals that are about to take a bite of that old leather-ridden old man there, just rough as he could possibly be. And he's down there and he's stretching out his jaws and getting ready to clamp down on his head and kill him quick and drag him up in a tree and eat what's left of him. And about that time, there's a, a bright light that comes out and it's not the moon. And uh, that bright light comes out and he says, I'm the lion of the tribe of Judah. And uh, that's my servant. And you leave him alone. And that lion said, yes, sir, I didn't know he belonged to you. I'm sorry, I apologize, sir. And he begins to back up, you know, like a backslider does. He does the Michael Jackson out of there. You know, he's, okay, Lord, yes, sir, no problem. You know, they're, they're communicating, you know. And they get ready to the, do the T-berry shuffle out of there. And I think if I know the Lord, you know, the Lord looks down there and he sees him shaking and he sees him shivering. See, the Lord sees you. Amen. You think he doesn't, but he sees you. Amen. And he looks down there and he said, boy, that, that kid looks, uh, he looked kid. He's the ancient of days, see. Elijah's an old man, but to the Lord he's a kid. Amen. I think he probably took his outer robe off and laid it across him there like a woman would lay a blanket over a newborn baby and maybe brushes that hair out of his face, and he says, oh, look at there. That moon begins to pop out over that juniper tree, and it begins to send little beams of light down through there, and little shards like crystal shining through a crystal chandelier begin to light up the face of that old preacher there, and he looks on there, and he sees salt tracks where those tears have dried, and those little trenches where that time has stamped with its roughshod hoofs has stamped crevices down in that man's face. And he looks at the salt dried of those tears that have run down that old man. And he goes over and he starts a fire. Pulls up a couple of logs there and puts some biscuits on the oven there in the, on the fire. Puts a cruise of water by his head. He says, what, well, it doesn't say biscuits. Well, in the original Greek it does. <laughs> <laughs> the trilateral root word of the Hebrew there, it's biscuits. You have to look real hard for it there. I'm a southern guy, so it's biscuits, you know. You just need a little syrup and some gravy. But at any rate, and uh, Elijah is kind of waking like the young'un was in the back there when he's waking up from his nap a while ago. He begins to wake up, and he's, he's thinking, well, it must be heaven. It smells like it. There's biscuits cooking. And he looks across the thing there, and he tries to rub his eyes. Man, every bone and every joint he has is hurting. He's dried out. He's like the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel. And the Lord says, you know, can these bones live? <laughs> Thou knowest. I don't know. We'll see. And he looks down at him and he said, uh, you thirsty? <laughs> Say, how you know? It's a cruise of water right by his head. He knows he's dried out. Do you know emotional stress and strain can dry you out? Do you remember the story I told you about the lady that just got dried out? Spiritually, if you hadn't been to the well and had the Lord give you a drink in a while, you know what can happen? You can act crazy. And he drinks a little bit of water and he says, am I in heaven? He said, no, no, I just came down here to visit with you a while. Oh, oh, you're him. Oh, well, I'm sorry, you know, I dropped the ball. I'm, I'm, you know, and I'm sure that the Lord, you know, he said, well, I got something I want to talk to some preacher you are running from the woman after all I did for you. That's not in the passage. You know what the Lord said to him? Are you hungry? You say, why? He needed something to eat. You know, one of the greatest things you can do when people are in the hospital or when they're in the throes of depression, don't give them a green drink. Look, I know I get all the health food stuff and all that stuff, and I probably know more about it than I wish I even knew about it and all that kind of a deal. But, man, when you are depressed, I don't want to eat fresh mowed grass. 
you know, put in a blender and spun. And I, it's still, it's green. It's like, it's, ah. Uh. And, and then you're thinking, did you just mow this this morning? You know, I mean, you know, you'd be surprised what a batch of cookies would do. You'd be surprised what a cinnamon roll would do. I, I stood, I, that's, that in, the, in the original, that's manna from heaven. <laughs> and then the other part is the white hoary frost, you know. That's ice cream from heaven. <laughs> Stays frozen until you can get it home and eat it. That's why you could only have enough for one day because it melted. <laughs> you get that in a minute. <laughs> you know what I love about the Lord? He puts a story like that in the Bible. That's the creator of the universe. And he thinks nobody cares about him. And look who shows up when nobody cares about him. The Lord said, well, I care about you. You matter to me. And so they sit there. I can't imagine what they talked about. Must have been a great time, though. He's sitting there eating biscuits and drinking that water, boy. I mean, having a time. That water tasted like ice cold milk, man, right out of the spring. I'm telling the story. I'll tell it the way I want to tell it. <laughs> and Paul says, off a little bit of coffee there, and his eyes begin to feel like there's, you know, 10 pound weights on the lids, and he's trying his best to stay awake. This is a great time, Lord. I'm having a great time. This is, Lord, I'm, Lord said, You tired, are you? Well, you know, you. Not only killed 850 prophets of Baal, son, but you uh, also walked a long way. You've been all kind of here. You know what he does? He doesn't push you, pa push you past your physical limits, folks. He doesn't expect you to be Superman. You know what he says? He says, are you tired? And he said, uh, yeah. He said, well, take you another nap. You say, why? Because, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes you need some rest. You just need breast. Sometimes you got to pull the plug. Even when it comes to spiritual things, read your Bible and rest a little bit. Rest in the Lord. <laughs> Somebody you feel good. See, you're Bible believers. You say, well, if I'm not on the firing line, well, you, it'll be here when you come back. Sometimes you just got to step away a little bit. He said, he said, he said, well, Lord, you know, I've been listening over here. Something rattling in the bushes. The Lord said, yeah, I heard that over there. <laughs> I think that's Leo the lion over there. Well, Lord, I mean, what if you don't, don't worry about it? I got you. You go ahead and go to sleep. I'll watch for you. Amen. If I could paint, I'd have that fire glowing. I'd have the Lord leaning on a staff like this and just standing there. And Elijah would be stretched out right here, and the Lord just sitting there. Just, and I'd say, in his watchful care, that's what I'd do. And just have it be the Lord himself standing there. And I'd have all the lions sitting there like they're getting ready to get on Noah's Ark and all the tigers and all the other animals. I'd have them all lined up out there and I'd have them all sleeping in a little ring. And then you pull back from the picture and you see all these rings and they're all there around the whole campfire there, the Lord right in the middle, and all of them just to protect him while he's sleeping. And then out of the forest, I'd have a little lamb come snuggle up next to him, <laughs> keep him warm. Yeah, but I got a vivid imagination. He, he wakes up the second time and the Lord says, uh, are you feeling any better? He said, Lord, you know something strange. He said, you'd be surprised what a little fire and a little, a little light, a little warmth will do for you. You'd be surprised what a little a good meal will do for you. And you'd be surprised what some water will do for you. But Lord, you'd be surprised what just some good fellowship will do for you. You know what was missing? He didn't have anybody. He just needed somebody to spend a little time with him. You know what some people need? They just need you to spend time. They don't need you to straighten them out. They don't need you to get them doctrinally in the right row. You know what they need? Just spend a little time. I'm not saying doing evil stuff. How you doing? You want to get a hamburger? Well, the Lord didn't knock the tar out of him. You know what happened though? He gets up out of that meeting right there and he goes into the cave and the Lord manifests himself there in three different or four different ways there. And you know what the Lord said to him? Now here's the, here's the whole thing. You know what the Lord said? And I'm not in the earthquake and I'm not in the wind and I'm not in the fire. And then he gets right up in the back of him, come right over his shoulder and he said, I'm in the still small voice. Here's the problem, Elijah. You got too far away from me. You couldn't hear me. 
at the end of that thing right there, Elijah said, I and I alone. And the Lord showed him the whole deal. And he said, now light out. And he goes over there and he calls Elisha. And that boy goes 10 more years. And he never drops the ball and never makes a mistake. And one day they cross the Jordan River over there. And he looks up there and he kind of grins. And, and the young preacher says, Elisha says, what you see, preacher? He said, oh, I see something about the size of a man's hand. He said, stand by for heavy roll, son. You're fixing to see something. About that time, here comes the Lord in a fiery chariot. I mean, fire-breathing horses, boy. Their hooves are kicking up off the solar system and sending lightning bolts down through the universe. And they pull up in that thing right there, and the Lord reins them in, boy. And you can see those muscles on those horses. rippling. And the Lord, like a chauffeur, opens the door. He says, how you doing, preacher? I hadn't seen you in about 10 years. And he says, yes, sir. Boy, I sure am glad to see you now. <laughs> he said, man. And he said, this is the guy I was telling you about. And Elisha says, this is the guy that came over there and met you under the juniper tree? He said, that's him. Different manifestation. He said, what's he going to do? He said, he's carrying me to the house. And he loads him up and he carries him home. Now, let me ask you a question. He was depressed and he was discouraged. He was downtrodden. He was half out of his mind. Would you agree with me? But God wasn't done with him. Amen. You know what he said? Kill me. The Lord said, nah, you're, you're, you're just right. I just need to make a few tweaks. You're good to go. <laughs> but his perception was the Lord's done with me. Watch, I'll give you another illustration. Remember Pete? Went out wet bitterly. Peter, remember? And then he said, I'm going fishing. Took all the other boys with him. Remember? You know what the Lord does? He goes over there and he says to Peter, he said, you love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. Okay, well, feed my lambs. <laughs> Pete, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir, Lord, I've been to Bible school. <laughs> what is it you want to know? You love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. And what he's saying to him is, what in the cat here are you doing out here taking care of fish and going back to commercial fishing job? I called you to do something. Peter's like, Lord, I can't do that anymore. I made a mess of it. The Lord said, no, that's good. You made a mess of it. Now, fess up and get up. Let's go. And he tells him the third time, and after that, except for what Peter says about John, Peter never drops a ball again. As a matter of fact, they beat Peter over there in the book of Acts, in Acts uh, 5, you know, no, Acts 4. You know what the, uh, Peter says? He said, ain't this a blessing, man, to take a beating for the Lord? <laughs> you say, why? He couldn't quit talking about Jesus. But if you were to look at him in that microcosm of his life after he betrayed the Lord, you know what you'd say? Well, he's done. He ought to be like Judas. Just go out and hang yourself and let your guts bust open. That's what it says about him in Acts 2. Judas went out and hung himself. His guts bust asunder, but his body burst asunder, right? You look at him in that microcosm of life, you know what you'd think? God done with him. Can't do nothing with him. Now, I just gave you a couple of illustrations in the Bible. But I don't think the Lord would direct a message like that at a time like this with all the stuff going on. You've got enough trouble on you right now worrying about the virus and worrying about the Ukraine and worrying about this and worrying about that. Mass don't mass, vax don't vax. Should I, shouldn't I, should I this, should I that. All kind of church trouble going on and stuff like that. In the meantime, you're getting a swad, you're getting overrun, you're getting drowned in your sorrows and your troubles and your problems and you're thinking everybody's just running by me and I'm scared, slapped to death and I'm depressed and I just want to get out of here and the Lord came by tonight you know what he said are you hungry you thirsty are you cold I got a blanket for you you need some light come over here by the fire you say why I'm in the still small voice just got a little too far away from me come let's reason together though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as wool though they be red like crimson they shall be as snow Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason your burden so way down is you're out of the yoke. Just come get back in the yoke with me. Well, Lord, I, I'm not fit for doing anything right. Don't worry, I'll pull it. I'll do the plowing. I'll take care of the things that need to be taken care of. Just get back in the yoke with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe have our accompanists come up here and play. I want to ask you a question as you think about it. Could you be Elijah tonight? Do you need some time under the juniper tree tonight? You just curl up under the juniper tree and for a few minutes say, Lord, uh, what about me? Lord, can you help me? Well, if that's you, why don't you come here? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. 
Some people are just getting down right there by their chairs. How about you? You say, what do you have to do? You have to bow your head and say, Lord, I need help. That's what you do. Say, Lord, I need help. Help me. Help me, Lord. I'm right there. Of all the things that preacher could preach tonight, why is he preaching on that? Because the Lord cares about you. He came by here tonight because he cares about you. Say, well, it's not, it's not for me, preacher. It's not for me. I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. Okay, well, put it in your saddlebag and later on down the line, I can assure you need it. The tears are flowing. You people that are here, you got either folks you know are in trouble or you're in trouble. And you know people need help. People are leaving this earth right and left now, not just because of COVID, because of fear, because of depression, because of discouragement. They need to walk with Jesus Christ now more than ever before. Now, if that's you, I'm going to turn it over to your pastor after I pray. If that's you, would you consider coming? Would you consider spending some time? Would you say, Lord, I, I just need to get back in fellowship with you. I need you to talk to me. I need you to help me. I need you to speak to me. If that's you. you